Uh, we've got a great topic. It's really sticks and bricks. It's the physical side of senior housing. Uh, I'm a big fan of that as I have now entered the ranks along with everybody else. Uh, I have a small factoid for you and that is do you, out of all of the job creation, I'm sorry, biz new businesses formed in the United States, do you realize that 70% are formed by boomers? So that's why when, when we all walk down the street, we have a lot of young people look at you and go, when are you going to get out of the way? Uh, and that's fine, but you know, it's a very active group. We continue to set the pace. We continue to set the standard for what, what our society begins and, and remains to be. It's an active group, in, uh, but we have to prepare for what's to come, and sticks and bricks is one of those things. You know, in the world of lending, and I can say that now that I'm a member of the group, we call the... Uh, there are a lot of euphemisms you've heard and a lot of, lot of uh, uh, alphabet soup, but we call them go-go's, slow-go's, and no-go's. And that's what we are going to talk about. It. I'd like to think I'm still in the go-go group, but uh, you know, we are going to move up and we're going to move up very rapidly. But we have three terrific people to talk today, and I promise to sit down soon. You know, senior housing is the full continuum from independent living to all levels of assisted living. And, and I managed to, my mother passed away a couple of years ago and she was 92 and I managed to follow her through all of those, you know, that continuum and it was just fascinating. Um, and when the thing I learned and if there's something I could pass along to you is you have to be your own advocate and you have to be an advocate for yourself in order to take advantage of all that there is today. So what we're going to talk about today is um, the multifamily structures to single family structures from independent living, the cost, the amenities, all of the things that are involved with those issues as we do. And first today, we have uh, Steve Rubin, Director of Project Development for Harkins Builders. A very experienced, Steve's a great VHDA uh, partner, uh, an excellent builder. Also Michael Foster, who's the principal and founder of MTFA Architects, very experienced in architectural design for senior living. And finally, Justin Flango is Chief Architect and Urban Designer, Center for Urban Design and Research, Arlington County. So I'm really looking forward to what they have to say, and hopefully we'll have a little time for questions. Stephen, you're up. All right, well, thank you uh, for having me here today. Uh, hopefully you can all see that nice, pretty picture up there. Uh, I was asked to uh, come today to really just give you an overview of senior living sticks and bricks as Michael and I were talking about briefly. Um, I was listening to a lot of the uh, uh, prior speakers and it was more uh, um, esoteric stuff and more uh, financial stuff. And this is more of a um, picture show and uh, show you what we have been building uh, over the last uh, almost 50 years. We, um, we, uh, we had, we're headquartered in, uh, in, uh, Central Maryland, although we we were founded in Silver Spring. Here's a, a quick a couple slides on uh, Harkins Builders, um, not to be too much of an advertisement, but uh, just want to give you some background on who we are, what we do. Uh, we really focus on uh, affordable housing, multifamily housing, senior living. That's really the crux of our business model. Um, and we are strictly a construction manager. Uh, we uh, per, uh, prefer to uh, build for third-party uh, clients, and we uh, really are, are managing the process for our clients. I see a couple of our clients in the room, actually. Uh, the AHC, APA are here. Um, we've, we've also built for VOA, uh, Enterprise Homes, uh, a few others in uh, Northern Virginia. And um, geographically, we have been building in Arlington County for uh, almost all of the 50 years that we've been in business. So. Um, a long time ago, we we renovated quite a few uh, apartment buildings. We've 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 um, in, in fact we've renovated things that we built from scratch in the '60s. So you know the company's been around a while. When you start renovating projects, you have no one to blame but yourself for that uh, problem that you uncovered in a wall. Lots of challenges today in uh, senior living. We have uh, probably the largest challenge is the cost of putting the product in place. Um, and that really, you know, we're, we're hiring subcontractors for everything we do, and we provide just really management. Um, so, you know, the product consists of uh, labor and materials. Materials uh, or commodities have been pretty stable 
lately, there was a period of time where the appreciation was pretty tremendous, but we've stabled or we've, we've stabilized that pretty much lately. The problem now is labor. So I know part of the, the topic of the conference is, you know, how do we afford housing for senior living uh, folks on less incomes than, uh, you know, the, the, the wealthiest that can live in the, uh, you know, the higher end product. So part of our challenge is uh, being able to build these products at an affordable price for our clients. Um, labor market has shifted drastically. Uh, Northern Virginia is really, we believe, the epicenter for that in our territory that goes from, say, Richmond uh, all the way up through north of Philadelphia. Um, although the union rates are pretty low in D.C. compared to Philadelphia or New York, we just have a, a really huge labor crunch for skilled labor. Um, it's evident on everything we do. Um, overall, hard costs, uh, my uh, second to last bullet on the slide, um, it's kind of a, an overall statement, uh, depending what type of product you're building, whether it's high rise, low rise, mid rise, um, medical office building, you know, we, we do a few of those, but um, overall, hard costs are up 20 to 25% um, since the bottom of the recession, which for us, we felt the recession in, um, acutely in 2009 and 2010. Um, so, you know, we, we um, and as some of our clients in the room can attest to, um, when we have to, you know, show a budget to a client, um, usually the first question is, oh my God, uh, why? Um, and uh, it, it's a uh, never-ending battle to um, get the costs to where they need to be to make a lot of these projects work. The other big issue for us is parking. Um, gone are the days where you can just find 10 acres um, with nothing on it and figure out you're going to build a six, you know, maybe you only need six acres and you want to build a vertical four-story building and you can just park on the surface till your heart's desire and off you go. Um, today we're going down in the ground several stories, which when you start doing that, you entertain removal of rock, which is never a, a that's the four letter word in our business, right? So um, you, you have problems there and you've got problems with contaminated soil. The list goes on and on and on. And uh, next thing you know, you're spending $40,000 of space to build a 150 space garage under the building. Uh, moving on, um, product types. I guess I was really asked today to talk about, um, um, so, the product types in the senior living space that we're building today are uh, shown here. My last bullet is affordable or not, and usually um, all these different type of product types aren't geared towards affordable. Uh, the only one that I know of is the 9% uh, tax credit for low, you know, low income housing tax credit, and um, you know. The, the senior population or the age tar the age restricted senior deals for those types of projects tend not to score too well and um, never gets never seem to get funded through that program. We we work in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and the District of Columbia, and uh, majority of our projects that we build through the tax credit program are for families. They're not for uh, uh, an age targeted uh, group. So let me just run you through the, the, the different product types. I'll kind of try to show you some nice pretty pictures and uh, um, try to answer any questions you have real quick and then maybe we can save some for the end. CCRC, I heard one of the prior speakers actually tell uh, or explain what that acronym means. I, I can't tell you how many of my contemporary aged friends, I tell them what I do and then I say I build CCRCs and they say, what is that? You know, they're, they don't understand. So. Continuing Care Retirement Community, uh, we've built uh, many of these. I just wanted to highlight two of them, Lutheran Village at Miller's Grant. Now, some of these aren't in Arlington, but I thought they were pretty impressive enough to, to show you them anyway. Mercy Ridge is another one. These Both of those were in Maryland. Uh, typically very large entry fees, um, several hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, quick story, my, my father turned 82 last month and just bit the bullet and decided to go into one of the, the uh, entry fee projects and uh which made me feel pretty pretty good to make sure he's being taken care of so he said the good news is we moved the bad news is there went your inheritance 
So I, I said, great, thanks. Um, no, actually, it, it was a good move for him and uh, um, overall. So uh, they're highly licensed, regulated by the states that they operate in. Uh, very difficult to get started in today's world. Um, this is a, a view, and I have to hand it to the architect, landscape architect, I guess. It looks pretty awesome, doesn't it? Um, believe it or not, that's in central Howard County. It looks like uh, the prairies of uh, the middle of the country, I guess. But um, this is a job called Lutheran Village at Miller's Grant. Uh, I won't bore you with all the nitty-gritty details, but we just broke ground last month. Uh, it's about 265 units. You can see some of the individual cottages around the ring road or on the perimeter. Um, in fact, those have the highest entry fees um, uh, of the entire project. Uh, but you can see that, the, and I don't have a pointer, sorry, but um, if you can envision the, the, the Port of share entry area in the middle, that's really where the common core is and that's where all the services uh, are, are held our services are uh, offered. Each wing is a different type of project, uh, different type of product, excuse me. Uh, independent living is the majority of this project and they have some assisted living wings and also some dementia care units, um, which I believe are on the far left, um, a little bit more quiet um, or um, oriented towards uh, a courtyard. So that project, um, believe it or not, took about three years to process Again, real difficult to get started. It was a 50-acre site. It was a, it's a cornfield essentially today. It was the land was donated to the Lutheran Village uh, nonprofit, uh, which made the deal a lot easier to finance. Um, I just read a press release on this thing a couple of days ago, and they they were touting the fact that they had 120 million dollars in bond sales to support this deal. And so I started scratching my head thinking, well, I know what the hard costs are, which are about $63 million. And I can do math pretty simply on my iPhone. And you subtract that. And it was amazing that where's the other 60 plus million dollars go? It's, it's, so it's, it, these jobs are extremely expensive to get started and uh, have a humongous amount of soft costs. Um, this is another one that, that's probably seven or eight years old at this point. This is in uh, Cockeysville, Maryland, um, a job called Mercy Ridge. Same exact type of project, uh, but it's, it's uh, seven years old. Um, again, a faith-based um, uh, developer did that one. Again, you're at the top of the market uh, price-wise, high entry fees, high monthly fees. Um, Let's talk about assisted living. We've, I think everyone in this room has probably heard of the uh, uh, Sunrise Assisted Living brand. It's celebrated name, went bankrupt. And in, you know, the, the uh, last couple of years has kind of reconstituted itself. In fact, we just got a call the other day. They want to start thinking about uh, developing units again, uh, which is encouraging actually. Um, Brightview Senior Living, which is a brand name that is uh, owned by Shelter Development. Uh, they've, uh, we've been lucky enough to build about eight of their projects uh, in the Mid-Atlantic. They're all the way up into New England at this point. Uh, we are un under construction now, actually just finishing up one of their really cool projects in Great Falls. Um, Villas at Sawfield Meadows, which is um, a project for the, uh, is it, um, I think it's the Falkir uh, Health Center. Um, it's in Warrington, really beautiful uh, project. Lower entry fees, this particular delivery is a lower entry fee but higher monthly fees. So maybe it's not several hundred thousand dollars to get in, but it's, um, the monthly fees are pretty substantial. And you know, one of the advantages, they have a central food service where you can have access to food um, in a meal plan. Uh, this was one of the Sunrise projects. I think this might have been the one that we built for them in New Jersey. But uh, one-story cottage-looking product. Uh, this is one of the Brightview products that we built in uh, suburban Maryland, which you can tell the, the, when you have enough room and you can spread out and you could put surface parking out there for pretty cheap, you know, you start to develop these models where they have wings. And uh, one of the wings is reserved for dementia. The rest of the project, I believe, is, is mainly um, independent. Uh, living, which is really just an apartment, full kitchen, 
uh, you're independent. You know, if you want to go to the food food area for some meals, you can, but there's really no service for you. Um, and then they have a, a pretty nice amenity package. This is in Harford County. Um, this one is the Great Falls one. You can see it's it's an older picture. It's still under construction. Different architecture, obviously. That's a really cool shot of the uh, villas at Southfield Meadows. This is the one in Warrington, Virginia. Independent living, uh, really, the way I guess I define that is it's an apartment with an age restriction. Uh, Erickson kind of, if everyone's heard of the Erickson Senior Living, Erickson Living, I guess is their, the way that what they call themselves now. They too went bankrupt. I guess there's a trend there. Um, so, you know, you have... Um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, examples of, of this, uh, Victoria Falls Heritage Run. Um, actually, one comment there was active adult as opposed to inactive. You know, I, I never understood that, why some of these are called active adult. What happens when you leave? Do you become inactive? I don't know. Skilled nursing, we've started to kind of do a few of those. We have one in Waldorf that's under construction, short stay rehabs. Uh, there's a picture of that. And then I don't have any pictures of these, but what we're starting to see these days are um, memory care and Alzheimer's wings are part of assisted living, but um, the trend is, you know, we're seeing a lot of those uh, where developers are asking us to uh, build a 50 unit building just for that use. There's, they say there's such demand coming for that end user, if you will, um, that they want to, uh, build 50, 60, 80 unit buildings just for that um, uh, customer. And I, I, I was going to throw a bunch of cost ranges on some of these, but I thought that would get a bit confusing, and I actually left one of these on there. So, um, But typically those are in the $175 to $200 gross square foot range. Um, there's a nice picture of one of our projects on the front porch. I guess, you know, this is just my thought, but if affordability is the challenge, um, how do we... Uh, develop and build structures that lead to an affordable way of life, I guess, is the issue. Um, if you have any uh, questions, uh, you can feel free to email or call me. Um, and I have a couple brochures I can leave on the side if anybody has any interest or desire. Thank you. And I'm, I'm really glad to be here today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about single family uh, neighborhoods and uh, aging in place in, the, in, in some of those. Um, so when you're looking at single family houses, I think um, you know, one of the main things that's gonna help you be able to stay in that, in that location is, is flexibility and options. Um, and so one, one strategy for that is uh, the idea of accessory dwelling units. So having some other um, unit type on the same lot as your, as your primary dwelling, um, which gives you options. You can live in the main house, you can live in the accessory unit. Uh, it gives you options in terms of having uh, caregivers living with you or uh, family members. Um, and, you know, it's something that as, as you're younger, you know, it, it's knowing that you sort of have that, that ability to, um, you know, that you'll have that flexibility later on as you get a little bit older, but it also um, gives you the ability to have older parents kind of living with you. So, um, so th this sort of increases your, your likelihood that you're going to be able to stay in your existing home. Um, and so there's a lot of benefits that come along with that. So, you know, you, you're staying in the same neighborhood. There's familiarity. You, you know your neighbors. Um, you don't have to sort of uproot your life in order to, to sort of meet your new housing needs. But there's a lot of economic advantages to that as well. Um, so, you know, if you're living in a single family home, um, there is no, no other unit type on, on your lot. It's just, just the one house. Um, so before your retirement, and obviously this is sort of an oversimplification of, of expenses, but it sort of gets at, at least the housing expenses. So, uh, you know, you're living in that home, um, you're, you're earning income before you retire, um, and you've got the mortgage and you've got your property taxes primarily when it comes to housing. After you retire, you take out the, the earned income, you take that out of the equation. Um, unless you're lucky enough to have paid it off by the time you retire, you still got that mortgage and you still got those property taxes. Um, so now once you add the uh, accessory dwelling unit to the equation, um, before you retire, that's so you're earning income, but you're also getting income from a, a rental property if you're renting out that accessory dwelling unit. Um, and then after you retire, if you decide to stay in the main house, you, you've still got some kind of income coming in um, from that. Uh, but even better, if you decide to live in the, the small cottage or apartment on, on your property, um, so now you're, you're 
you're before you retire, you're getting your earned income, and you're getting a lot of um, sort of additional income from from the main house. And after you retire, again, that's sort of a, a good source of income for you. So, from an economic standpoint, as well as the flexi uh, flexibility standpoint, um, accessory dwelling units on on your single family property make a lot of sense. Um, and they come in a lot of different types. So, you know, something like this over and over a garage is sort of the traditional type, um, not necessarily ideal for seniors, but in terms of allowing you to stay in your main house and generating some income or having a caregiver uh, living with you, um, that's certainly a good option. Um, probably a better one is the, the standalone cottage, so actually a separate um, unit on, on your property, um, as well as, you know, other things, uh, both in attached and uh, detached units, um, having a, a separate apartment in the basement. Um, so now, in addition to um, the, the ability to do something on your own lot if you're in a single-family house, um, another important thing is to sort of looking at the idea of expanding options within a single-family neighborhood. So if you can't necessarily have, um, you know, a cottage or something else on your property, um, looking at the idea of actually embedding um, multi-family units within the single-family neighborhood, but in a way that's um, context sensitive. So uh, this is actually an example from Norfolk. Uh, it's a, a new neighborhood. It's a primarily single family neighborhood. But there's uh, a number of multifamily units, very small buildings that are sort of integrated in there. And so the ones that are highlighted and run there are uh, some very small apartment buildings. And so you can see that the, the architectural character of those is very similar to the houses. The scale is very similar. Um, so they don't really stand out very much. Um, the, the picture on the left is actually uh, a, a close-up picture of one of those from the example I just showed. Um, uh, the example on the right is a uh, sort of a slightly different format. Uh, but by the way, the one on the left is four units. The one on the right is two units, so that's sort of st uh, two stacked apartments. Um, actually, the one on the right is my mother's house. Um, she uh, uh, it actually works out really well. She lives there's a one-story apartment on the ground floor, um, and so she she lives there. And then the upstairs is rented out, um, which is a much larger unit. Um, so, you know, just sort of looking at um, not only Arlington, but just sort of in other places, um, the idea of sort of selectively uh, finding spots where you can add very small, um, very small multifamily buildings in there. So where they, they fit in, they're the, you know, the character is the same, um, but you're sort of getting the advantage of being able to have a, a slightly different unit type. It speaks to affordability and uh, seniors, you know, moving out of their house, but not having to leave the neighborhood. Does anybody recognize this, this house? Any chance? Um, so, you know, the idea that roommates aren't just for seniors either. So, uh, by the way, this is from the Golden Girls. Um, uh, and, um, you know, in a lot of ways, actually, I thought it was interesting. Um, Janet and Elizabeth's slides were kind of talking about um, the, the income um, sort of disparity of, of different um, or, or uh, income ranges of different age groups. And so if you look at sort of the under 25 group and the over 65 group, actually, some of the incomes are very similar. Um, and so, you know, what do younger people do? They tend to have roommates and they live together and they share houses until they sort of can afford to go out off on their own. And uh, there's a lot of other similarities too. They, you know, they tend to be single. Um, seniors also tend to mostly be single as they, as they get much older, whether they're divorced or, um, you know, they have a deceased spouse. Um, and so, you know, the backstory with, with the Golden Girls is Blanche Devereaux has this, this house. Her husband passes away. Uh, she can't afford to keep the house anymore, and so she has to try to be a little bit creative and try to figure out a way that she can keep it. And so she takes on uh, these three ladies as boarders, and, and of course, you know, hijinks ensue, and they eat a lot of cheesecake. And um, <laughs> but I think you know this is a model. It's certainly not for everybody, um, but I'm sort of actually surprised that you don't see it more often, especially um, sort of in the aging population. So you have that companionship, and um, there's the economic advantage as well, being able to share those homes. Um, now, I think another important thing, too, for, for single-family homes, you know, you kind of look at the actual physical environment, the, the actual physical living unit, um, and certainly you want to have that so it's, it's as livable as possible for you as you're getting older. Um, but really, I think the most important thing, or equally important, um, is your surroundings. So, you know, you, you can't just sort of look at the, the place where you're living in isolation. You have to sort of look at the context. So um, it's important to have a livable community that you're in. Um, and so th it's a, a term that was actually coined in the 80s, a naturally occurring retirement community. Um, and it's a place generally where seniors want to be. It, it wasn't designed that way, but they want to be there because there's easy access to transit, they're shopping and dining close by, uh, good walkable streets, cultural and social activities close by, well-integrated parks and recreation. 
Um, op op uh, opportunities for interaction with other age groups. Um, so rather than putting everybody sort of uh, at one age in one place, you're kind of mixing everyone together. Um, and then there's a wide range of housing types within a small area. So you can move around as you age or in your different stages of life, but you don't have to leave the neighborhood. Now the great great thing is that Arlington already has a lot of this, um, and certainly there's a little bit more that we can we can do here. But um, you know we're, we've we're already started, and I think a lot of uh, really a lot of it comes down to how um, how do we adapt then the the individual homes or individual single family um, blocks uh, to be more accommodating to seniors. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll try to make up some uh, lost time here. Again, I'm Michael Foster with MTFA Architecture. It's good to see so many friends and folks that have been involved in this community for so long. But it's also good to see some new faces here as well, as well as a few faces that have disappeared for four or five years and have come back. So that's good, good to see as well. I'm going to try to um, you know, fit my comments in between uh, Steve and Justin. Uh, we're, we're kind of the that in-between world where we're not um, doing much out in, in suburbia with large tracts of land. We're working on very small tracts of land, but we're trying to have a, an important impact. We want to recognize, I think before I change this slide, I want to point out, you know, Arlington's an amazing place. Unlike a lot of cities that have a CBD and then a bullseye that goes out, so by the time you get to Tree Canopy neighborhood, you really know we're near transit. Uh, Arlington has this tent pole model, and as you can see, we'll be, um, you know, this is a, a blow up right in Clarendon where, I'm not sure if it's got a laser on it or not, but uh, we're right from the metro, two blocks in a single family neighborhood. And that's true throughout the area. It's a unique opportunity for some of the things that Justin talked about, which I think we've been talking about in this county for 20 years, but he articulated them and illustrated them in such an elegant way. I hope it becomes more a part of the, the conversation. So thank you, Justin. You know, one of the things that in these transition areas, a lot of churches that were built in the post-World War II area, or, or era were right in between those areas. So many of you are familiar with the, uh, the views at Clarendon and as well as some of its history. But I think it's uh, interesting, and I really appreciate what um, Joan McDermott uh, said at the beginning of comments, this aging in place is so important because then you're aging in community. And when you're thriving in community, your community will be thriving. And I think that is so important and it's so well said because we, we find through observations, and I think uh, Terry Lynch said there was, uh, with all the data that's out there, and we've heard a lot of good data today, but we also, the best data is sometimes the anecdotal, anecdotal eyeball data where we see things. And sometimes we see things we didn't expect from the data. Uh, in this building, not only are there the target market for the affordable housing, there are some seniors that have moved in because they are from the community, they couldn't afford to live, in homes they bought and paid for, bought and retired the debt, and the taxes ran them out of their own neighborhood, gave them a chance to stay in their neighborhood. This is important. You know, and it's still part of this community where that thriving in place, what we find just from anecdotally is a lot of these seniors, not, if you move them out to suburbia or into, uh, into out of their communities, it's harder for them to contribute culturally to the resources, knowledge, experience, but also contribute economically. So they remain a very important part of the community. We found some of these very tiny spaces, very small spaces, are actually wonderfully scaled in proportion for how much you clean and take care of. So some of the things we designed for one market actually translated to the other market because the living rooms become outdoor spaces. That's where they go, fresh air, health, and community. Unfortunately, we're a bunch of architects, so we take pictures when nobody's there. I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> that must be a requirement for architects. I don't know why that's true, but uh, we wait till everybody leave or else we ask them to go stand in the corner and take a picture. I uh, can't figure this out. But it's not just Arlington. This is a project we did, and again, eyeball anecdotal information or, uh, and, and intelligence here is, this is a project in Harrisonburg, Virginia, again, right on the edge of Market Street, two blocks from neighborhood, a neighborhood right behind this picture, a single family neighborhood. And what, this was just an industrial area because no new development had happened in Harrisonburg for 30 years. All moved out to 81, the highway and the big boxes. 
So we target marketed this building for students because the university is having a housing crisis and they're putting the kids in motels. So in, in student housing, you don't rent per bedroom or per unit or per square foot, you rent per bed. And, and this was something new. So we said, how do we get um, you know, 580 beds in this 225 unit building, which is a different mix than you'd see in the RB corridor, and we were targeting it for students. And with students, you have to buy to come in and um, you know, everybody moves in in September. So if you don't absorb in that one month, you could go bankrupt before you get on the chance again. So we made sure we were about a month and a half early and that therein lied our mistake. The problem is by opening a month and a half early, it was substantially filled in, filled up before the students had a shot at it. This really upset univer the university <laughs> because they were counting on this for a capacity problem and they had to go back to the hotels. But what we learned and we did not plan, we wanted to do something fun, steel trusses, industrial look, corrugated metal, kind of hip, edgy, you know, these spaces that continue around. And what it got absorbed with were seniors. Because <laughs> they didn't want to be out some suburban sprawl place where they couldn't walk to the store or see their friends or go to their church. They just took over this place with maybe a few people from, a few young docs from the hospital and a few people from Rosetta Stone, but it was a lot of seniors just had this pent up demand and it was closer for them to walk or drive their spouse to um, the hospital, which is not too far away, and be in the community, exercise healthy, over absorbed before it, you know, and these are very small units designed, frankly, to be super cost effective, lean and mean for students because we figured they're going to put their stereo speakers on center blocks. But that is age myself. We don't have speakers anymore, do we? <laughs> anyway. So anyway, it's the outdoor spaces that become the living room to these small areas. And we're finding this over and over again. Right down the road, Virginia Square Towers just opened. Again, targeting young professionals. That was the model. They went and um, everybody complained this building was too tall until we added a floor to incorporate on-site affordable housing. Then it was about the right size. So that's good. <laughs> but, but what's interesting, it's amazing how size and or detail and occupancy affects perception of mass and density. But it's, um, but it's well detailed and has a lot of good amenities. And we're finding the market there is all over the board. We target one thing. It's a very sophisticated developer that knows their market very well. But times are changing. So we're seeing you know, spaces that would target a, a marketplace coming in, people of all ages are responding to. Amenities that allow people to get out and connect with each other. Uh, very small units that have personal care of attention, whether you're a single or a double or living there in community, they really, it really works well and still connects you to the outside. This is a rendering, it's not finished yet, but an outside plaza park along the Greenway pedestrian trail is very desirable for people that don't do stairs, all this is uh, ADA compliant, and need a social living room because all the people that filled up their bedrooms are off to college or somewhere else or have families somewhere else in the country. So we're seeing this pattern. I'll just go through these very quickly. Uh, right here at uh, Wakefield Manor in Arlington, uh, the demand for this, this kind of product to concentrate density while preserving market rate affordable housing starts to address the need across the board. And just giving that a, uh, a presence while preserving, not tearing down, uh, housing stock that is market rate and provides a need. It's really diversifying the need. Um, we're seeing this so often. This is over uh, in Bethesda, and you'll see here, see this little house? This is what is all back, this is old Georgetown Pike in the metro, and this was, I should have the before picture, it's a, a small Lutheran church with a two and a half acre of a parking lot with cracked asphalt and weeds growing up and service mounted, or service dumpsters. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is maintain and concentrate uh, their space and uh, worship. Let's see here. If I look. Yeah, uh, a daycare with worship, the offices, and a gymnasium uh, community center uh, tucked into one side of the site to give them presence. Uh, While well, this is early in the stages of design, adding about 175,000 square feet of residential to give a, a mix of market rate and uh, 
trust me, in this building, there'll be very affordable housing and rather unaffordable housing. But that's, we think that mix actually is helpful to the entire community. Uh, just going down, another example right across from the arena stage in Southwest. This is be the first project as part of the new wharf uh, development, which is uh, St. Augustine's Episcopal Church. Uh, their maintenance cost was exceeding their, their, um, you know, their ability to what was in the, in the hat as it went around. So by having something that is more expressive, ADA accessible, and connected visually to the community, uh, it is something that um, had a presence and transitioned back down to the neighborhood across from Arena Stage. And as you can see, it's uh, tucked behind about 150 um, uh, residential units. Really just, uh, I don't want to say adding density, but it's intensifying the concentration of land around resources of metro and people and, and creates a much more desirable place to live. Uh, they, we're, we're currently working on probably oh, two dozen of these around the country. This is one that was a, a church in DuPont Circle, St. Thomas Parish, that burned in 1970 during the riots uh, after Martin Luther King's shooting. And it stayed a set of ruins for 40 years, the proverbial 40 years in the desert where they tried to figure out what to do. And they had probably three projects per decade drawn and approved that could not be funded, could not be realized. It's three per decade for 40 years. And so this is an early study of, of preserving the ruins and using a mix of um, IZ, uh, uh, integrated zoning uh, residential to support rebuilding the church uh, on the corner, which that's a, a design for uh, putting a brand new building to restore their program and their prominence on 18th and Church Street uh, here on DuPont Circle. Now, I'm gonna stop because we're out of, out of time here, but um, I just think the message that I'm hearing is it's not about a policy, it's about having a toolkit full of policies. And I think uh, you know, both Steve and Justin have uh, illustrated some examples. We're kind of the in-between, but the opportunity of this group to understand better and be advocates, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you. You did a really good job staying in the time, all but Steve, that is. We have time for a couple of questions. Walter. Thank you for the speaker on the appropriate dwelling, but I welcome other to add comments back. What have you found the existing and with excessive dwellings in other jurisdictions? We took a shot at it even on two years ago, and it was kind of a difficult conversation we had few uh, cents, and probably a single number, maybe, maybe not much more than, than, than that. And yet, in other places, it seems that work really well. What do you think are uh, the elements that have created acceptance in other areas, and how were those concerns that uh, maybe they have getting into uh, those uh, places there answered? Did they true, or were they not, uh, not necessarily uh, an issue? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, well, I think really the best models to look at are um, and, and places where sort of there's, there's the least resistance are places that have had accessory dwelling units for decades, if not hundreds of years. Um, and I think that's the sort of the places where um, they're sort of the most established and um, they're just sort of part of daily life as opposed to something that's, you know, it's sort of a reversal of what's what's been done already. Um, I can't think of any municipalities offhand that have recently sort of switched from um, not allowing them to allowing them. Um, but I think sort of looking at some of those uh, more historic places, I mean, you know, you think of like Charleston, for example. Um, I mean, there's tons of those houses. Even though the lots are already very small, there's a lot of instances where you see, um, you know, little apartments over garages or in the backyards or um, in other places. So, um, you know, I think sort of looking at more mature places as, as examples would sort of be the best, you know, places that have had them for a long time and you can kind of see the benefits over, over a greater period of time. Yes, ma'am. Well, 
So, so my understanding is there's only been 10 done to date in Arlington um, under since 2009, which is when the um, the county started allowing them, but under very sort of very specific circumstances. Um, I think right now the the reason why there aren't being more done uh, is just because of the restrictions. So there's a, a restriction that sort of ties the uh, the size of the accessory dwelling unit to the size of the main house. So it, it can only be a, as large as a third of the main house up to 750 square feet. Um, and it has to have sort of separate um, heating and air conditioning and things like that. So it may, ends up making it a little bit more complicated. Um, so I think that's why we haven't seen more of them. Um, and it also can't be a standalone structure. So it can't be over a garage. It can't be in a, a standalone cottage. It has to actually be part of the main house, which means you either have to adapt a, a basement for that purpose or put an addition onto the house that's actually connected to it, which makes things a little more complicated. So what can be done to get more of it? Uh, lessening the restrictions on them, really. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a tough thing because, you know, there's sort of the fear of the unknown um, and you kind of feel like, I, I'm sure the community kind of feels like if you open Pandora's box, like it's kind of hard to close it again. Um, but again, really, I, I think the best thing to do is to sort of look at places that have had them for a very, very long time okay. and sort of look at the statistics and numbers and kind of see how those have worked. Okay, last question over here. Walter, could the accessory dwelling uh, situation be approached neighborhood by neighborhood as opposed to the whole county? Could, could a neighborhood association go to the county and say, we recognize the need for this, and if it makes in our neighborhood, we would approve, da da da. Or does it have to be done for the whole family? You want me to answer? <laughs> uh, I mean, that, obviously, that's something that has to be well thought out in a given neighborhood. I mean, we welcome ideas all the time, and something like that really would be, I mean, we would have to take a look at it. Okay, we, we just want to run out of time. On behalf of the Virginia Housing Development Authority, thank you all very much, and thank you for our panel. You're, you are our great partners, and, and keep doing all the things you're doing because you're the poster child. Thank you.